So this, this presentation, I'm going to be as brief as I possibly can and try and entertain you as, as well as give you some information. I'm going to talk about five different things. I'm going to talk about wealth, the size of wealth in Canada. Can you hear me with this? I'm okay? Yeah. Second, um, how the, how the ultra-wealthy invest. Thirdly, uh, what is a family office? People talk about family offices a lot right now. I'm going to give you a brief outline of what a family office is. I'm going to talk about something really important called family governance. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about the virtual family, family office and how you can better your business by providing services virtually to your clients. So let's start with how big is the market? How, how, how many wealthy people are there in Canada? Well, there's 5,500 Canadian families with $50 million or more. 80,000 families with five to $25 million. And there's over 700,000 families out there with between a million and $5 million. There's a lot of money out there. When you tell people, the average Canadian, uh, how much money is out there, they don't believe it. But there is lots of money. And I, I, I know that many of you are working with some of the $50 million families and some of the $1 million families across the board. So there's lots of money out there for us to be had. The top 10 per concentration, the top 10% of families, what do they control? You could see uh, from the chart that Canadian, the top 10% of families in Canada control about 55% of all the wealth. Some countries are more concentrated. Not surprising to see the US around 75%. But as you can see, there's a concentration of, of wealth and power, for that matter. And in Canada, it's sort of always hovering around 55 to 60%. Um, and you could see that here. Some of the countries like Russia, you can see that they practically control you know, almost all of it at 85%. So let's talk a little bit about how the wealthy invest. The wealthy obviously have more options, right? So, so let's, North Americans, they are more focused on developed country equities, New York Stock Exchange, TSX, those kinds of things. Europeans uh, have been uh, investing longer than North Americans. They're focused on real estate, understandable. <laughs> Asia-Pacific countries, they like developing market equities, which is along the lines of emerging markets. Those markets are, gro are growth markets and growing very quickly. And something that's been trending is that private equity is getting a lot more attention these days than hedge funds. So some of you in the room may remember the sort of the 80s and 90s uh, hedge funds who had super returns. You had these hedge fund managers returning 40 and 50 and 60 percent a year, year after year after year, and it was phenomenal. The market got crowded out. A lot of hedge funds um, stopped earning those returns, and people focus more attention on, on the private equity side of things. So this is, this is the geographic focus. So us being in North America, we, we focus mostly on, um, on developed markets. OK, what does your portfolio look like? That's a little donut of what it looks like. But I can tell you that bonds are about 23%. Equities are about 28%. And 6% of that is in emerging market type stuff. But 45% of the portfolio is in alternative investments. Okay, that's low correlation to active markets out there. That's, that's why that's attractive. 17% of that is in direct real estate. And about 14% of that is in private equity. So that's the split. But also there's another split that you might not see uh, that's not readily evident. And that's liquidity. About a third of the portfolio is, you could sell it within five days, fairly liquid. About another third of the portfolio you can sell within 30 days. And the back end, the last third of the portfolio, beyond, uh, beyond sorry, three months and closer probably to a year. So, that, so not only is it diversified from the perspective of asset classes, but also from a liquidity perspective, right? So that's what the ultra wealthy really look at and, what, and, and what they're, when, when they're investing. Here's a hot topic right now, <clears throat> active versus passive, right? So with the advent of index funds and ETFs and all that other stuff that's out there, it's always important to look at, you know, how can your portfolio be balanced between active and passive? So the wealthy, ultra wealthy, are looking at their equities, about three quarters of their equities are still active, and only about a quarter of it is passive. Now, Guardian, we're active managers, so that kind of brings a smile to my face. And on the fixed income side, it's about two-thirds, one-third. 
I have to caution everybody. We've gone through 10 years of pretty solid markets, right? So when we go through these, these periods of solid markets, that's where indexing and passive investing becomes a little bit more attractive because we haven't had the downdrafts that we've, we've seen the last 10 years. If we go through a period, a, a year or two or beyond, of markets being choppy, I think you're going to start to see active management getting even a bit more traction. But as markets do well, it's easy to go passive and continue to go passive. Here's another surprising fact. This might make the manual life people a little bit happier. Wealthy people borrow money. They borrow money to make investments, right? So it's not, it's not strange to see that 17 or 41% of, the, uh, of uh, real estate is leveraged. But what surprised me is that 14% of fixed income is leveraged. So people are, are investing in fixed income and they leverage 14% of it. Equities at 16% is about right. And I bet you a lot of that is specific. I'll give you an example. Right now, GE is trading. It's not a, I'm not promoting GE, by the way. It's trading at $9.5. Great company. You roll back the clock a few years, and everybody's talking about how powerful GE was. And so you might take a wealthy investor who says, I'm going to buy into to, to, to GE, and I'm going to leverage it. They'll buy $5 million of GE stock and leverage it against the rest of their portfolio. So I think a lot of that leveraging you see on the equity side is, is stock specific. OK, enough about how they invest. Let's talk a little bit about um, the family office and what it is. I think I'm making good time here. I got my shorts underneath, so that's, that, should, that should be okay. Uh, what, what is a family? So I hear about it all the time, and people want to create them, and they want to create, um, you know, uh, OCIOs or outsource the uh, chief investment officer type firms, and that's that's the business I came from at BNY. Um, here's this, here's the kind of the, the menu of things that a family office can do. Everything from investments to legal issues and insurance to valet services, right? Personal services and shopping, entertainment, taking care of your boats and things like that. That's pretty broad, broad spectrum. But don't be fooled. There, there's family offices. You go to the Boston area and you'll see lots of these kinds of businesses. Here are the types of family offices. There's a single family office and a, multi, a multi-family office. So a single family office is one family. Like, I think we're in the Astor room today, right? A-S-T-O-R. I bet you they had their own family office. They didn't want to share with anybody, right? The Messinas, for example, we're, we're, we're one of eight billion. So you know, it's our family office is not really a family. It's a family closet, I think. So, so what, what do we have here? We have about three quarters of the, uh, of, of the business of family offices actually being single family offices. And most of those actually don't include the family business. So, you know, I'm a wealthy family patriarch. I have a family office, but I exclude my business. Whatever I do, making buttons or needles or whatever I'm doing, I exclude it. Just a singular family office talking about investments and the family going forward. That was interesting to me. Here's a little bit of history. You've got to be careful when we read these statistics, though, right? So when was the uh, family office founded? So what, 67% of it was really found, of the family offices were found founded in the last 20 years or so. This speaks to continuity, right? This speaks to survivorship bias. So family offices cease to continue and they break down eventually if certain aspects are not maintained. And I'll talk about those later. But you can, there's also been some super wealth built in the last 20 years in Silicon Valley and beyond. Um, that's created this, this family office. Whenever somebody come up with, some, somebody can come up with a, a game or a, a widget or something like that and make 200, 400, or a billion dollars, that's phenomenal. And that's happening. That's never happened in the history of man before, where wealth can be built so quickly. How big are these family offices? So people say, well, Ant, how, uh, you know, how, how big do I have to be to, to, to have a family office? And I, I always say, you got to have at least $500 million. Like, you really do. And they don't believe it, but it's true. The average family office is $800 million. That's big. The total wealth is about $1.2 billion. So we, you know, if you really want to staff a family office appropriately, you need to have some big money. And, they, and the reason why is because you have to hire the top people. 
So here's what the average family office has staff. You got 11 people, and four of them are part-time. So part-time people, who could that be? That could be a bookkeeper, that kind of a person, a curator. I mean, if you're wealthy, you got a curator. Somebody's gonna organize a, all that art. Like for me, I got a hockey card collection. I think I could do that on my own, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> you like that, huh? So, but you need these people, and these people are not gonna come cheap, right? You're, you're a wealthy family. You can't hire some chump CIO. You gotta hire a top person. You know, like, like me, for example, I wouldn't go over, I'd, I gotta be paid at least $27,000 a year. I wouldn't go. Real estate, whoops, I went backwards. 27,000, it did go backwards. Um, the rule of 72, simple. The rule of 72 is that, sorry, 92, is that 92% of families will lose their wealth by the third generation. Done. Third generation, 92% money gone. Patriarch, matriarch, make the money. Second generation, they start to spend it, the third one, gone. No more money left. You want to be in that you want to be in that eight percent. So if you're running a family office, you want to be in that eight percent. It's really, really hard to be in that eight percent because the focus always is on the hard needs. You know, like let's get the trust lawyer in here and the tax guy to do all the configuration and put a company out in Luxembourg and and, and all this fancy stuff. And and they don't focus on the soft things. And I can guarantee you from my experience. And we're all really good advisors, and we have little specialties. It's the soft, it's the soft stuff that counts, right? It's the soft stuff that really counts to get into that eight percent. So remember the stat about the survivorship bias I talked about. The survivorship bias is that survivorship bias is that third by th the third generation, it's gone. So that's why we had so many family offices that looked like they were created in the last twenty or thirty years and the ones in the 50s are somewhat gone, it's because they don't make it. This is a very interesting thing, is that we see a lot more of this around philanthropy and something called impact investing. So philanthropy can define a family and often keeps that family unit together. We have, there's lots of family foundations, especially in the US, and they have a cause, whether it's education or medical or whatever it might be. And that holds the family together, it gives them a purpose. Impact investing is taking form as well, where it, you know, a family will get involved with their foundation to make specific investments. I, had a, I used to work with a, a young analyst, and <laughs> these young people are crazy. Um, they'd go, he'd spend his uh, vacation time going to Africa um, working on microfinance. Um, that was his vacation time. I think when I was his age, I was spending vacation time not doing that. Like, you know. <laughs> so, but I, I, I can't believe it. I mean, some of them were so purposeful. So, and, and, and interesting as well, when he did that, um, so the, he, the, 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 it was being funded by a family, and most of those entrepreneurs were women. And I, I, you know, that's quite encouraging to see that as well. So impact investing, making a difference. You got to make money at the end of the uh, at the end of the day, but they're not so much concerned about that. They just want to make a difference. When you get wealthy, um, it's it, you get hounded by charities and not for profits. Trust me. If you have a business and then you sell it and you make five hundred million bucks, that phone will not stop ringing from people from Manulife calling. I mean, uh, banks calling you. Um, uh, and charities as well, right? So, but where do you get your advice? People do not use professional advisors in philanthropy to help them, and they should. They're out there, like a good insurance advisor. They're pros, and they, and they know what they're doing. A lot of people take no advice from anywhere. Sometimes they take advice from their peers, and, or a lawyer, or a tax advisor, or whatever. But by and large, they're, they're out on their own. They have to define themselves and what they want to do and what their family wants to do. I, I, would, I would really strongly suggest that, that they, they look at having somebody who's in the business advise them and help them. Succession. Here, here we go into a, a very, oh, there you go. Oh, yes. This, so this is a very important part. This is the getting into the 8% and, and being successful. So what's the most important decision you make related to your wealth? Really, the most important decision is who you choose as 
who's going to be your advisors. It's not whether you bought GE or that stock or bought that insurance policy or set up this configuration. It's really about getting the right people. That's the hardest decision you'll make. And if that comes into play, everything else is going to come into play um, from a hard as, uh, from a hard skills perspective. And the biggest risk really is not you, it's your kids and then their kids. And some, sometimes, a lot of times, who they marry as well. I, I have no advice on that. <laughs> my wife's in the audience, I'm sure she has a, a bunch of that going on. This is one of my favorite co quotes. It basically says, it's really hard to make a lot of money. It's really hard. But it's 10 times harder to keep it. 10 times harder to keep it. So, okay, you've made it. So I'm talking about trying to keep it and pass it on to the next generation. And this is one of the richest families in the world and we'll revisit the Rothschild family. And they're telling you, man, this is, it's sort of like winning a, a cup of some sort, a Stanley Cup, whatever. You won it, it's even harder to win it the second time to stay on top. Here are the three things that are really important in combating something called affluenza, right? You're wealthy, you're, wealthy, you're 20 years old, and you know it. Terrible. Only wish it would happen to me. But anyway, <laughs> here are the three things we need to know. These are the three pillars, very, very important. Communication, roles, and rules. Without this stuff, you're going to be in that 92% number that I mentioned. So let's go through it fairly quickly. Communication, and a lot of times things break down in communication because it's, it's, there, is not, there is not enough communication. There's not enough formal communication. We need formal communication within the family unit at different levels, whether it's you know, at the corporate level, at the, at the more foundation or family level. Is it formal? Is it informal? Having meetings is important, structured meetings, maybe with an outside chair coming in, right? There's a famous French fry family from out east that went through a lot of differences in, in family communication. They ended up bringing a lot of people from outside, sitting on their board meetings and their committee meetings, and, and created a funnel of communication, different levels of communication, right? And that was really important. I think they're on, on track today. Secondly, roles. Who does what? Does the oldest son of the oldest son automatically run the company? Shouldn't, more than likely. Does any family member end up running the company? Right? Why does my son get to run the company and my brother's daughter doesn't get to run the company? Right? So decisions about who does what and where. Family business, who's going to do that? Foundation. Who's going to run the foundation? Not only the money in the foundation, but potentially what are we going to what are we going to donate to? Right? The investment side of things. Do we have somebody within the family who's smart enough to be to, to run the investment side? What about events? Events are really really important, right? So family gatherings, the education side of teaching people. Uh, what they can do and what they, they need to do from a perspective of being part of the family. Even something as simple as a family picnic, a get-together. That keeps that family unit together, increases the amount of communication. Highly likely you'll hold on to your money. Spouses, how do we fit them in? Do we fit them in? Children, when do we include them, right? When, when do you, uh, most of the time, wealthy families, kids find out they're, they're rich from other kids. They're like, hey, man, you're rich. <laughs> what do you mean I'm rich? No, my mother told me you're rich. <laughs> right? I think it was the opposite for me. Uh, you got no money. <laughs> but anyway. Um, and then you got to have, you got to have rules, right? You have to have rules around what you're doing. Let's, 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 I'll focus on philanthropy today. So if the focus of the family is going to be uh, education for 75% of the money and let's say medical for 25% of the money, there's no use me bringing up an idea about environmental issues. That's not the focus of what we do, right? Our family, that's not what we do. This is what we do as a family, right? So uh, Schillick, he wants to, <laughs> a lot of money towards education, putting his name on business schools and engineering schools. It's pretty clear what the Schillick family wants to do. 
It's education. That's really what they want to do. So you have to have rules, how decisions are made, who's part of the family, who's not part of the family, and, and, you know, and their inclusion as well. Rules around dividends. Is there a payout? Is there not a payout for out of the company? Um, uh, and, and how do you borrow money? Like I used to be, I am still friends with a guy who's a standard oil descendant, right? Standard oil, level one, level two, level three. He's probably level five. I mean, standard oil is 100 years old. His family is probably worth between 700 million and a billion dollars. And he's level five. So they've done a really good job um, at preserving their money. He actually runs a family office out of Boston. They pay no distributions out of that family trust to any of the children, but they do lend them money. Here's a simple structure, right? You have your family business, you have an executive committee. Do you, ha you, know, do you have some people from the outside, some people from the inside at the executive committee level? You have an investment portfolio and a foundation, you have a family council, a different group of people potentially there. And the last thing, again, I go, I go back to it, these family assemblies, really important to holding the family together, right? The family, I mean, the family's gonna get bigger fast. And so you have to put this stuff in, in place early so that there's a feel to it. My favorite stories here coming up. Vanderbilt, Rothschild. Cornelius, what would be a short, what would, they, what would his friends call him? Like, uh, what would be a short form for Cornelius? Uh, something, I, I don't know, I'll have to think about that one. But he, uh, in 1877, he died, left $300 billion, uh, who was the richest man in the world at the time. By 1973, they had a family get together and not one millionaire amongst them, right? So they burned through that money. Meyer Rothschild started a little advisory business, started advising governments, started advising um, uh, other institutions, kind of you know, got going globally, thought internationally. Family today is worth a trillion dollars. Now that family's like, like that, right? So today they're worth a trillion dollars. The Vanderbilts, think Gatsby. Think Gatsby, that's all I have to say, right? Great parties. Everybody had a Tesla probably. Um, they had no family gatherings at all till 1973 and, and, and great parties once again and no education as well. Like stacks and piles of lawyers and accountants figuring out how to do things and move things, broke. Rothschild immediately got into, never dispersed any money directly and they always had family gatherings, had education things, they had family banks, you can go to the bank and borrow money, they were allowed to co-invest in your ideas. That's, that family's still <laughs> carrying on. They make, you know, I mean, I'm familiar with their, some of their wines, but they do a lot of other things too, I'm sure. So here's the difference between family structures, and this, uh, and, they were and the Vanderbilt, wealthiest family in the world at one time, down to zero in about 100 years. Right, so the rule of 92, remember? This is, this is, this is a, a fantastic quote. I mean, like Madison Avenue couldn't have written this better. Give each child enough money so they can do anything, but not so much that they can afford to do nothing. Right? Just keeping, keeping that in mind is, um, is really important. Okay, getting to the virtual stuff, and I got about six minutes left. <clears throat> Let's get to the psyche of your client. Your wealthy client comes running a business. The business is leveraged, the concentrated, it's a liquid. The person running that business, industry expert, knows about that business inside out. Nobody knows more than that. Has a narrow focus. That's the entrepreneur, right? You've been servicing this entrepreneur for years and years and years. Great person, great family, la la la. Sells the business either to another party or decides to um, take it public, perhaps. What ends up happening? Now he's got a, or she's got a portfolio, deleveraged, it's diversified, it's liquid. Is this person an industry expert? Not really. They think they are, but they're really not, right? They made a lot of money that they, some people think that they made a lot of money that makes them an expert on everything. It's not true. And they have a lot of broad interests. They all of a sudden become motorcycle enthusiasts and golfers and curators, wine experts, 
uh, all kinds of funny things. So, you, okay, so here's what I have to say to you. You need to become your client's quarterback, and how do you do it? First of all, you have to remember what your primary offering is. What are you good at? Be honest with yourself. And I'm going to tell you, I know for me, for my own sake, I am not good at everything. I am good at some, this narrow corridor of things, and then I know a lot of people who are good at other things. Like, I know 100 people who are good at insurance. They're right here, right? So that's, that serves me well. The key pitfall that people have is that they think they're good at everything, right? They're good at tax, they're good at this, they're good at that, and so on and so forth. You can't do that if you're going to run a virtual family office for your client. You have to find out who the best people are, right? So you have to determine the, the, your client base and what their needs are. I don't, I don't propose you do this for all your clients, but you know, think about the top dozen or half dozen of your clients. And think about what, you, um, what their services are. Keep in mind that you want to surround yourself with the best advis advisors to help that client, right? So things like that, that uh, one of the things I say there is that, keep in mind, just because a person is a good lawyer, I'm gonna pick on lawyers, doesn't, and they're a good real estate lawyer, they're probably not a good trust in estates lawyer, right? And a lot of times wealthy people use the same lawyer for everything, you can't do that. You have to unbundle that. And don't forget about yourself, lastly over there, is that you have to keep your saw sharp and you have to become part of round tables and industry associations to make sure that what you're doing keeps up the speed for your particular client, right? So you have to create that network of advisors out there to help your client. Let's avoid the cozy decisions, right? Your sister-in-law, as an example, a club associate. I mean, there are people who are good, who are sister-in-laws and club associates at whatever they advise on, but let's not make those decisions automatic, right? So if I'm looking for anything, anybody, if I'm looking for somebody um, in the uh, accounting business, right, I have to create a list of top accountants or tax accountants or bookkeepers or whatever that I want to work with because I know they're really, really good and promote those relationships, right? So really, why is it important? Because if I develop a list of, say, three, right, then I have a choice of three to put in front of that client. The client looks at me and says, okay, well, Anthony is independent. He's bringing me three people. I get to decide if that's what the client wants to do. Also, it gives you diversification because you know, your client may not want to work with somebody who's 25 years old, or conversely, may not want to work with somebody who's 65 years old. So being diverse in age and whether it's male or female really helps. So in creating your list of advisors. So if when you're creating these different lists, could be a, could be a mortgage broker, could be a real estate agent, could be a lot of different things. Um, but you need to have that list to help your top tier clients do what they need to do. Training for the softer skills. I'm going to go through a really quick example about family governance. Uh, about seven or eight years ago, uh, we sold our business to Bank of New York Mellon. And um, in selling it, they had, some, they had eight family governance experts around the world. Eight. And I thought, you know, I'm a good communicator. I don't really need to go through this stuff. I can talk to people and whatever. And I went, um, so we had one family governance um, uh, professional come in, speak to a family. Actually, a family's out of Des Moines, Iowa. They had one kid who was a rock star, a failed rock star. Um, a stay-at-home mom who was a hardcore environmentalist. So the rock star was in New York, hardcore environmentalist. And then we had another kid who lived in mostly in Germany and was an investment uh, guru. Wasn't an investment guru, right? So how do we glue this family together? They came in, these things usually happen on the weekend. I was amazed at this, ex this family governance expert, how they walked the whole family through on the Saturday and Sunday. It was phenomenal to me. I thought, I don't know the half of this. And that's when I started taking courses within the business and whatever, and trying to learn how to deal and counsel people. And I encourage you to do the same. Um, I don't think anybody's a natural at that kind of thing. Some people are gonna be better at it than others. But you know, dealing with dysfunction, and we know that our clients, they get through uh, issue, family issues that causes dysfunction, um, is very, very difficult. And staying neutral in those discussions is very, very, very difficult as well. So all I can say is, from personal experience, uh, don't assume that we know it all or you know it all, as I 
I can give you some really good examples. Here's three things that I think that are really, really important. Try and create an annual meeting for your client, right? This is really useful in gluing your relationship together. So I have a client, I'm in the investment side. What do I do? I pick a date, whatever. I have the lawyer come in, the insurance advisor come in, whatever. Other people come in, tax people, whoever surrounds that client. So that annual meeting not only sets up what's happened, but also what's going to happen, right? So that client says, oh, you know what? I, I got a quarterback here. And that quarterback can be anybody. It can be a lawyer, an investment person, an insurance person. It doesn't really matter. Somebody's got to take charge. And I, I'm going to guarantee you that 9 out of 10 of your clients are going to love the annual meeting. They're going to love it. So much so they want you to do it quarterly and then take them out to dinner as well. Or just maybe they want the dinner part. I'm not sure. But it, it, it's really, really effective. Secondly, education updates, right? These, uh, most of your clients are isolated, right? They're, doing, they're running their business. I'm talking about your top tier clients. They're running their business and they don't have time to do stuff. You have to be their eyes and ears to make sure that they go to certain topics that are of interest to them, um, regulatory or otherwise, they're in, uh, informed of that. And lastly, have a little fun with them. Um, find out what their outside interests are and try and participate in them, whether it's charitable or sporting, that could be a lot of things, uh, or environmental, whatever the thing may be, right? So th those three things, the annual meeting for me, clincher, fantastic. It, it, it's, it's something that clients don't expect from you, and if you're able to do that, you're going to win. Okay. What are the benefits of this virtual family office getting this perfect group of advisors together? It's going to grow the goodwill of your business and reputation, 100%, without question. You're going to get more referrals. That's good. Some people say, oh, I'm too busy. I, I mean, I'm not even taking any more new clients anymore. No more, just I'm good. Right. That phone rings with an ultra wealthy family. You got time. <laughs> you got time. You're firing the guy at the bottom of your list. You're like, hey, yeah, I can't deal with you anymore. I got another. Blah, blah, blah. Right? I'm being sarcastic, but, but you know, you're going to get better quality referrals. They're going to come your way. Lastly, this last thing, it's really, really important. I've been traveling from coast to coast. Um, and the fight for talent out there, for quality people to join your business, is real. And advisors out there, uh, especially on the world source side, they're having difficulty finding quality young people to come into their business, right? There's, I'm not sure why it's not happening. I, I'm talking young people, I'm talking sub 30. Right? I'm not talking right out of university, which would be nice. If you develop a strong business right, with a good reputation, you're going to have a better opportunity to attract young people into your business and retaining your talent as well. Right? There's nothing more disruptive than having somebody of quality leave your business and go off and do something else. That's uh, the conclusion of my presentation. I've tried to run through it as fast as I possibly could. And I, I took four extra minutes um, from what I was doing, but I, I, I can take a question or two if that's okay, or should I? I'll be around all. all